So it looks like the mainstream media may be waking up to the problems of intersectionality and anti-racism, uh, or perhaps they have been more aware of it than I have realized, which I would consider a very good thing. But before we get into it, I'd really appreciate if you leave a like, a comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell to be notified every time I post a new video, since that's by far the best thing you can do to support the channel. Follow me on Parler and Twitter, links are in the description. Check out my subscribe star, link is also in the description. And with that out of the way, let's get to it. So Jonathan Chait, who is a well-known commentator, he writes for New York Magazine, he published this piece entitled, is the anti-racism training industry just peddling white supremacy? And he explains his basic issue in the piece. He says, the anti-racism trainers go beyond denying the myth of meritocracy to denying the role of individual merit altogether. Indeed, their teaching presents individuals as a racist myth. In their model, the individual is subsumed completely into racial identity. One of D'Angelo's favorite examples is instructive. And here he's going through an example that Robin D'Angelo, the author of White Fragility, likes to bring up. So he says, one of D'Angelo's favorite examples is instructive. She uses the famous story of Jackie Robinson. Rather than say he broke through the color line, she instructs people instead to describe him as Jackie Robinson, the first black man whites allowed to play Major League Baseball. It is true, of course, that Robinson was not the first black man who was good enough at baseball to make a Major League roster. The Brooklyn Dodgers decided, out of a combination of idealism and self-interest, to violate the norm against signing black players. And Robinson was chosen due to a combination of his skill and extraordinary personality that allowed him to withstand the backlash in store for the first black major leaguer. It is not an accident that D'Angelo changes the story to eliminate Robinson's agency and obscure his heroic qualities. It's the point. Her program treats individual merit as a myth to be debunked. Even a figure as remarkable as Robinson is reduced to a mere pawn of systemic oppression. One way to understand this thinking is to place it on a spectrum of thought about race. On the far right is open white supremacy, which instructs white people to fight for their interest as white people. Hence the 14 word slogan, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Moving to the left, standard issue conservatism tends to discount the existence of racism and treat all problems in pure colorblind terms as though racism has been banished. To the left of that is standard liberalism, which acknowledges the existence of racism as a problem that complicates simple race neutral solutions. Then he goes on to explain where the anti-racism training fits in with this. The ideology of the racism training industry is distinctly to the left of that. So it's to the left of liberalism. It collapses all identity into racial categories. And then he quotes from D'Angelo. It is crucial for white people to acknowledge and recognize our collective racial experience, writes D'Angelo, whose teachings often encourage the formation of racial affinity groups. The program does not allow any endpoint for the process of racial consciousness. Racism is not a problem white people need to overcome in order to see people who look different as fully human. It is totalizing and inescapable. Of course, D'Angelo's whites-only groups are not dreamed up in the same spirit as David Duke's. The problem is that, at some point, the extremes begin to functionally resemble each other despite their mutual antipathy. I want to make clear that when I compare the industry's conscious racialism to the far right, I am not accusing it of reverse racism or bias against white people. In some cases, its ideas literally replicate anti-black racism. Glenn Singleton, a president of Courageous Conversation, a racial sensitivity training firm, tells Bergner that valuing written communication over other forms is, quote, a hallmark of whiteness, as is scientific linear thinking, cause and effect. This is not some idiosyncratic oddball notion. The African American History Museum has a page on whiteness which summarizes the ideas that the races and trainers have brought into relatively wide circulation. The museum's page summarizes what it calls white culture in this astonishing graphic. And then he pastes an image of this graphic. I did a video on this yesterday showing what the African American History Museum had posted on its page. And it does appear that they have since removed it. Um, if you go now to their website, they have a post where they say, um, since yesterday, certain content in the Talking About Race portal has been the subject of questions that we have taken seriously. We have listened to public sentiment and have removed a chart that does not contribute to the productive discussion we had intended. Anyways, it may very well be that that chart was now taken down from the website, but the fact that it was up there altogether 
uh, shows what Shate is saying here, which is that this isn't some oddball notion. So anyways, I thought this was a, a pretty good article. He does a good job sort of summarizing what the anti-racism, what, what the problem with the anti-racism training is. And I was pretty encouraged to see uh, this type of criticism or highlighting of, of the problems of anti-racism training make its way into mainstream media.